Okay. All right. Well, hello everybody and uh, welcome back uh, from your various uh, workshops uh, and from Ecuador, uh, from which we had this extraordinary uh, perspective from what seems another world, but it's the same world. It's the same God's creation as the one we enjoy ourselves and the one we damage ourselves. And we've heard about various kinds of uh, poverty today, the, the poverty of biodiversity made poor by us, uh, the poverty of earth made poor by us exploiting its mineral riches and so on, and the poverty of other people, uh, other peoples who are much poorer than uh, we think we are ourselves. So it's a, a great pleasure to welcome uh, the Right Reverend Philip North, the Bishop of Burnley now, who's going to uh, provide our, our final thoughtful uh, reflection on uh, hope for the poor and create. So uh, welcome, Philip. Uh, it's great to have you here. It's lovely to be with you. Um, uh, thank you, all of you, for giving your time to this today. Thank you particularly for rescuing me from General Synod. Um, and, and for which I'll be eternally grateful. Um, I've gone slightly off my brief. Uh, I've talked about what I'm interested in rather than totally stuck to the subject. I apologise for that, John, but, um, uh, but I hope I've got uh, one or two things that catch your imagination a little as you end your day together. I have a nephew who's 20 years old. He's fiercely bright. He's an undergraduate at Cambridge studying German and history. He's also had a staunchly atheist upbringing, despite the best efforts of his uncle. Um, and last summer, when it was allowed, he uh, came to stay for a few days and one early evening he just completely disappeared even when gin was being served he still disappeared and I looked around the house and I eventually found him absolutely buried in a book and what really intrigued me was that it was a book of theology it was this one Jürgen Moltmann's latest book The Spirit of Hope Theology for a World in Peril he was absorbed by it and he's raised it in almost every conversation that he and I have had since People like me, bishops, clergy, church leaders of all kinds, spend huge amounts of our time wondering how we're going to reconnect with the younger generation, how we're going to make the Christian faith relevant to young people of today. And we throw vast amounts of energy and resource and money at this resource, churches, endless theological, endless new evangelistic ideas. But this generation is absolutely passionate about the planet. Surely what matters more than any clever idea is what we're saying and what we believe about nature and the world. And this is what Moltmann is calling for. Uh, now, an old man, of course, asking passionately in that book for a new ecological theology. We're destroying this planet to the point where it may soon tolerate us no longer. We're cooking it, we're polluting it, we're exploiting it, we're destroying its diversity, we're overpopulating it, and the impact of that is felt most acutely by the poorest people upon it. And I think we have to accept that traditional Christian theology is a big part of the problem. It's an ideology which has allowed a great deal of this exploitation. So for example, a theology of salvation can very often be presented as about escaping the world. Salvation is about escaping this world of matter. And that of course allows us to exploit it. A theology of sin can present the world as a dark place, a fallen place, a place from which God is absent. And if that's the case, it doesn't really matter that much what we do to it. A clumsy theology of creation can mean that we feel a call as human beings to subdue the planet, as if creation is really here for us, as if it's our plaything. And behind some of those clumsy theologies, there's a worldview in which human be beings see the world as theirs, something which we can use, something which we can plunder absolutely at will. So Moltmann is calling for a new theology and many theologians are working on a new theology and his book carries some of this new thinking. So let me just draw out two of the many points that he makes, um, two that are particularly uh, captured me. The first has to do with how humans relate to the world. In much traditional theological thinking, the human person is the heart of the world. The crown of creation is a phrase you read in a great deal of, of scholastic theology. Made last, human beings made last because they're the finest product of creation, God's greatest uh, achievement. Made in the image of God and thus uniquely authorised to subdue the world. Human beings are uniquely beautiful, uniquely precious. 
not so much of the earth as over it. The earth is ours, here for us. And that's the kind of thinking that allows for exploitation. There's a kind of arrogance implicit in that kind of theology. Maltman argues for a need for a different perspective. The human being in the Bible, in Genesis, was the last thing to be made in creation. But that does not mean we're the crown or the summit of creation, nor does it mean that creation has stopped. In fact, if we're the last thing in those biblical accounts of creation, what that means is that the, we are the most dependent. The world can exist perfectly well without us, and indeed there's evidence that that's what it wants to do, but we cannot exist without the world. We need it. We're made from the dust. We're part of nature. So we're not redeemed from the earth, as some might suggest. Rather, rather we are redeemed with the earth. And in fact, the very means of our salvation is of the earth the incarnate son of God, raised up from the dust, whose bodiliness is what sets us free. So to be made in God's image means to be God's representative, and that gives responsibility for the earth, not power over it. And so Maltman uses a wonderful phrase. He talks about a cosmic humility. He talks about our dealings with the earth characterised by a cosmic humility, accepting that we need the earth, we're part of it, and that actually, only when we realise that dependence will we become truly human beings. True humanity is not escape from the world, but a proper understanding of it. True knowledge is not power, it is wisdom. So that's the first point, how humans relate to the world. Then there's a second, it's not something really, it's just what's it captured me, how God relates to the world. In traditional theology, there's a kind of polarity about ways of describing God's relationship to creation. The first is that creation proceeds from God's eternal nature. So it's part of God, it is divine. But that for a Christian is what we call pantheism. We'd have to worship trees as though they were God. There'd be no distinction between God and the world that he makes. The second way, which is traditionally seen as orthodox, is that creation proceeds from God's free resolve. God chooses of his own free will to make something that is other than himself. And therefore, though it's made by him, it is not divine. It's a secular place. And that's really how we come up with the idea of the world as a fallen place, or as a place that is de-divinized, de a world that needs to be subdued. And that language can often be what lies behind scientific exploitation of the earth. Well, Montman posits a new way of looking at how God relates to the world, and it's rooted in the doctrine of the Trinity. The Father is the preceding cause, the Son is the creating cause of the world, but the Spirit is the perfecting cause. Creation is an ongoing process, with the Spirit as the one who imbues and interpenetrates all creation. So the world is not divine in itself, but it is shot through with the spirit. It's sustained and moved by divine forces. God dwells in the midst of it. And so to abuse it is to abuse the very being of God. And such a view allows for a new theology and a new spirituality rooted in our dependence on a planet, which is interpenetrated with God's spirit. I think those are two fascinating examples of what we need, which is a wholesale rethinking of our theology so that Christian thinking is part of the solution of the environmental crisis, not part of the problem. Let me end with a Maltman joke and the great theologian's comment on it. There is an old joke, he writes, two planets meet in space. The one asks, how are you? The other one replies, oh, I'm not well at all. I'm ill. I have homo sapiens. The other answers, I'm sorry to hear that. That's really bad. I've had it too, but never mind, it will pass. And then Maltman writes, that is the new planetary perspective on humanity. Will this human planetary sickness pass because the human race does away with itself? Or will it pass because the human race becomes wise and heals the wounds which it still continues to inflict on planet Earth? down to the present day. We cannot see 
our care of the environment as an adjunct to Christian life, as a bolt-on or, or as the interest of the few. We need a new theology of the earth and a new spirituality of the earth. And as I think my nephew shows, that new theology is what will capture hearts and minds afresh. Thank you.